I've been involved with uh, T-Space um, as an instructor for the architecture residency program since 2017, which is when the program started. And for the last three years, I'm serving as the director of educational programming, in addition to instructing our residents. Our co-host for this event this year is Hannah Hill. Hi, Hannah. Hannah Hello. Uh, will take just uh, five minutes for introductions while uh, everybody is settling in. For our new audience, I'll briefly introduce T-Space and its programming. So T-Space is a nonprofit organization. It's an initiative of the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation in Rhinebeck. And it focuses on arts, education, design, and ecology. In addition to the architecture residency program, T-Space organizes the synthesis of the arts events, which support the coming together of the arts and include art architecture exhibitions, poetry readings, music performances that all take place here on grounds in Rhinebeck, uh, where I'm also located today. We are thrilled uh, to have our current T-Space artist, Anne Hamilton, whose exhibition opened um, this past weekend. Uh, it's titled As After Is Before. Anne will be lecturing for the residency program tomorrow, in fact, a Tuesday on Zoom. We highly encourage you to join uh, the discussion as well as visit her exhibition here in person before it ends uh, in August 20th. This space gallery is open to the public and it's available to visit during open gallery days or by appointment, you can check our website. We'll put the information in the chat as well. So you um, are familiar and aware of um, open hours, but also um, upcoming T-Space events. So this lecture today by Leah Kelly, um, it's uh, along with others in the series, part of the architecture residency program, which is a 25 day intensive that takes place in July every year, and it's now in its seventh year. The theme of this residency is called Light and Polychromy, and young professionals and students from the fields of art and architecture join us to experiment with design and focus on critical thinking. Our residents this year are joining us on the panel from all parts of the world. Hello, and it's great to have you, Michael, Isabel, Resika, Yasmin and YP, it's great to have you in the program and uh, incredible work that you have produced so far. Um, we are very pleased that all our residents this year are supported with scholarships and are able to join the program completely free of charge. And they're also being offered a travel stipend to visit us here in Rhinebeck. And that's all possible thanks to the very generous support that's provided by Elise Jaff, Jeffrey Brown, Steve Pulimode, the, K, the JM Kaplan Fund, Leica Geosystems, the Alheld Foundation, the Pratt Family Fund, Archive Fine Arts Inc. and its affiliates, Art Creating Inc. and ACLA, Richard Armstrong, Arlene Shehead, John and Martin Cummins, Stan Allen, Margo and Anthony Viscusi, Donna Moylan, and Dr. Ben Chu. We thank you enormously for your support and for making this possible. And for our audience um, and others who are interested and willing to support, uh, the simplest way is to just text for architecture, just one word for architecture to 707070. You can also see this information on our chat and uh, we're very grateful in advance for your support. I will pass it on to Hannah now, uh, who can briefly discuss the webinar structure and then quickly moving introducing uh, to introducing our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Irini, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, my name is Hannah Hill, the co-host for today, and I just want to let you know that our webinar structure, it will be approximately uh, 35 to 40 minutes presentation by Leah Kelly, followed by about a 15 minute Q&A from our panelists and the broader audience. So if you have any questions while Leah is presenting, please feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, but if you do, please feel free to drop them in the chat and let us know if you'd like to know anything else while she is presenting. And um, we just welcome you for being here today. And I'd like to quickly introduce Leah before she gets started. Uh, Leah is joining us from New York. She is a neuroscientist at Rockefeller University, and her scientific research has been published in Nature, Nature Neuroscience and Cell Metabolism. She's taught at Columbia GSAP, 
Bard College and was an assessment committee guest for the undergraduate architecture degree project at Pratt Institute. Leah has given invited talks at the Artists Institute, the Rubin Museum, the New School, Pratt Institute, RCA London, Serpentine Galleries, T-Space, and the Watermill Center. She has consulted for well-known artists and exhibitions around the world, and her texts are published in AB6, Anti, the Athens Biennale, Log 52, Useless Bodies, and Domus. Her essay, Sense of Self, appears in Experience, Culture, Cognition, and the Common Sense, published by MIT Press in 2016. Leia's work is admirable for its research-driven content made accessible by her skilled writing and delivery. Her expertise lies at the pulse point where science, architecture, and art intertwine, and this unique perspective makes her an invaluable voice when it comes to architectural experience. Her work provokes us to question our human behaviors, and it beckons persuasively to the curious side in all of us. Please join me in welcoming Leia Kelly. <laughs> wow, thanks, Hannah. I wasn't expecting that um, touching bio, but I uh, I am really grateful for it because, you know, I read on the post, you know, that I'm this brilliant scientist and although I'm surrounded by many, many brilliant scientists, I think what I really enjoy doing is um, going directly to the research and distilling it and synthesizing it again for people who are non-scientists to read and apply. Um, so I'm very honored to be invited to be contributing science to um, the synthesis of the arts. Um, the title of my lecture is Organism Environment with a hyphen, because I think this is an important ecological concept and also it's so broad that it covers most of what I'm interested in, both inside and outside of the laboratory. And um, with this lecture, really, I want to emphasize the responsibility you have as designers in um, forming the thoughts, behaviors, and ultimately lives of the organisms you are designing for. And, um, of this generation and future genera generations. And I want you to see the scientific literature as this rich resource that you can go to for when you're designing, both for this kind of bottom up um, inspiration in terms of form, but also this top down um, exploration of how your designs might ultimately affect um, the organisms that are gonna be interacting with it. And then I want you, um, after you've kind of digested some of this and maybe your interest has been piqued to do some research, not only apply that to the environments that you are designing, but then kind of self-reflectively make sure your environment and your life and your practice um, embodies this knowledge so that your creativity and your designs a much more kind of fruitful, rewarding process for you. So the kind of entry point I feel that scientists and architects have in common is that we're both sort of obsessed with and concerned with the spatio-temporal aspects of being. And we have to represent that often to a global audience. So how do we capture something life that's ultimately a dynamic process um, and communicate what is going on um, holistically. It's, it's a difficult thing. And also scientists like to use models. Um, we work a lot with theorists um, to feed back experimental data back into models. And this is the sort of reciprocal relationship so that models become more and more refined. So we're both very pragmatic. We're doing things all the time, we're experimenting, but we also incredibly conceptual. And we also um, appreciate that something on the tiniest scale can have a huge impact. So um, research is done at all these spatio scales. So at the level of the molecule, which is often the gene, the neuron, 
circuit, system, brain, then brain interacts with the whole um, body, the whole organism, behavior, collective behavior, um, which more and more research is being done on. We have a great um, research at Rock Valley looking collective behavior at ants, of ants, for example, and then the impact on of the in, environment. Um, likewise, I, my technique is recording currents, electrical currents on the order of milliseconds. And then um, neurotransmitters can act on that time scale or other neuromodulators can act on seconds and minutes. Um, gene expression is across hours, days, months, years, behavior and growth. And then evolutionarily, because we know of the heritable nature of DNA, we, we're, we're also operating on this massive time scale. So for my PhD, I was very interested at the level of neuron-neuron communication and how the connections between neurons became stronger or weaker, which is the basis thought to underlie learning and memory, which I'll talk about later. And then after my PhD, I really wanted to concentrate on how the brain integrates signals from the rest of the body to drive changes in behavior. And I use um, feeding as a paradigm. So on the right here is the one of the mouse models we use, and it's missing just one molecule, missing one gene, which is represented in neon on the right here called leptin. And you can see just missing this one molecule has a huge impact on the life of this organism. Likewise, we can also induce obesity in mice by giving them a high fat diet. So I'm very interested in this tension between um, what is being genetically driven compared with what um, is changed from outside in, um, in this terms in terms of diet, but really everything that the environment provides us. And I wrote a piece sort of on biological time for the Rubin Museum. And I mentioned there the orchestration or precision timing required to cross traffic, shake a hand or utter a word lies below our threshold of awareness. And in conditions such as Parkinson's disease, um, schizophrenia and autism, this level of, of milliseconds, this time scale of milliseconds really matter. So you're never, a scientist is always going to appreciate that no detail is too small. And I imagine that when communicating with clients or policy makers, um, people are not convinced by the importance of small details, but a, science, a scientist needs no convincing. And through my work teaching at Columbia um, with Lindy Roy and then at Pratt on the degree project um, committee. There are many, many, many applications of neuroscience to design, far more than I can cover today. Um, but I hope this array kind of piques your interest. And what I'm going to do really is try and communicate some key fundamental ideas in neuroscience with the hope that. Um, you will then be intrigued to follow this up and less inhibited and less intimidated, maybe by looking at a primary source, a research paper, because you maybe have some idea of the language and the ideas. So I'm gonna talk about the action potential, which is basically the signal of a neuron. So when you hear people talk about neurons firing, neurons spiking, this is what they mean. That means they're firing action potentials, but really what is an action potential? And I'm gonna talk about a receptive field, which is sort of the sensory space that elicits a response in a neuron. I'm gonna talk about plasticity. I'm gonna talk about taxonomy of memory. And then I'm gonna talk about the sort of ideas that were stirred up in me and the thinking while writing this essay, um, Self of Sense, um, which is about embodiment, intelligence in the body and 
the extended the mind, the fact that the, the boundaries between ourselves and our environment are not as concrete as maybe we would imagine. So firstly, the action potential. So we all began as only one cell. And at this fundamental level, the cell must be able to say, sense changes in its environments and respond via these feedback loops to maintain a stable um, milieu internally. And so there's this concept of homeostasis where basically I think be summed up by insides resist outsides. And you can see that the external environment, if not properly regulated for um, across the membrane can have a very um, striking impact on both the form and condition of the cell. But neurons have set up um, a condition whereby the external concentration of ions is very different from the internal concentration of ions. And this generates a potential difference across the membrane. Um, you don't really need to understand the details, but I want you to understand that this difference across a membrane is what sets up the conditions for something to happen, really. And so this difference is maintained by these pumps that pump out the ions because of um, sort of diffusion, things are going to want to reach an, an, an equilibrium. But these, these pumps take, use energy to pump out ions across the membrane to maintain this difference. So it requires energy. And so we, because I study feeding, um, we eat to grow and you think we eat, need to, to um, function and move and do everything we need to do. But we're also using so much energy to sort of stay the same, to maintain this difference across the membrane. And Hodgkin and Huxley did these sort of classic um, fundamental experiments in a squid axon where they were managed to sort of clamp the membrane and observe and record currents across the membrane. And they realized that when the membrane becomes slightly depolarized, you get this kind of huge response, which is called the action potential. And it's this all or none response. And it's really um, how we think, a lot of how we base our understanding on the brain and how we think the brain codes information. But I also like to think, how can this, there isn't a review that I've sat on that inside outside isn't talked about really. So I'd really like you to consider what are the differences you're setting up across a membrane, a threshold, and how can you um, exaggerate that to really create some kind of effect? So secondly, the receptive field. Um, so how does a ray of light enter our nervous system? How does anything external get turned into something internal? And the surfaces of our body have a lot of receptors that both separate us, but you also unite us with our environment. And what I want you to take away that all sensory information is energy. You know, it's with light, it's photons, with hearing, it's mechano, with touch, it's mechano, with taste and smell, it's chemo. And so it's all um, a form of energy that gets transferred to an action potential, which is also another form of electrical energy. So I sort of want you to imagine ourselves as sensing all these different forms of all these different forms of energy and converting them into action potentials. And what I think is so cool about light is that light kind of gets inside us. Um, the energy of light gets inside us through various routes. So photosynthetic organisms turn light into their energy source. And then we eat those or we eat animals who eat those. And so we consume the energy from the sun that way. But also um, we can the, the light hits the photoreceptors of our retina and ultimately um, results in an action potential. And 
neurons respond to very specific different types of stimuli. I can't go into all of that now. This is a kind of simple, clear example, also using light because the theme of this year is light and polychromy. So this is um, to show that there's a type of cell, a retinal ganglia cell, that responds to um, light being shone in the center of the receptive field, but also there's a light, there's a neuron that responds to um, the light being turned off in the center of a receptive field. And that's to say that the retina responds very strongly to contrast and edges. And you know now that every time you see a little line like this, this is an action potential. So it's this like sudden influx, mainly of sodium ions, um, that's ca causing this electrical change in the membrane. And then another general principle of sensation is that the, the neurons that receive the in sensory information are actually topographically mapped. In the case of the retina, we call this um, a retotop retinotopic map. And um, the neurons from the, from the eye go all the way back to the cortex in this kind of relationship. So this, this is, in this experiment, this um, stimulus was given, flickering stimulus, and then to one eye of a macaque, sorry, a bit gruesome, and then afterwards there was this metabolic stain basically showing which neurons have been active. And you can see that there's really this kind of striking um, mapping going on. And this occurs in the, some shape or form across the senses, really. So especially in hearing and in touch, um, these are topographically mapped in the cortex. And another way we can say that um, the input is mapped is that the left and right visual field of each eye um, go to the left and right hemispheres of the visual cortex. And you get inputs from each eye forming these what we call ocular dominance columns. And you can see here that this is a human um, who donated their brain to science and they had lost vision in one eye. And again, this sort of metabolic stain was used and you can see the arrangement um, from the active eye. But on the other hand, even though you're getting this very um, striking fidelity between stimulus and response of neurons, if we think about it, if we were really faithful to our retinas, we would actually be walking around seeing the world with two black dots because where our optic nerve is, there are no photoreceptors. So our brain has to compensate for that. And I really want you to understand this concept because our brain is compensating for so many things all the time. This light is just such a striking example because you can really believe that. You know conceptually there are no photoreceptors there, but you know you're not walking around seeing two black dots. So your brain must be doing something. Um, and we resolve ambiguity, which I know Irene is interested in, by filling in what we think should be there. So if you close your left eye and come up to the screen and stare at the cross, um, and then slowly map, move back and forwards towards and away from the screen, you will see that there is a sort of spot where the black spot on the right completely disappears. Um, if you do, you got it. And so that is the moment where your brain has filled in. Because the rest of the screen is white, it's just like, oh, it's probably white in there. I can't tell, right? So you, you I, I really think that architects can really use that because you can actually create huge effects just by the sort of power of sort of sensory suggestion. So again, here is a good example. You probably see a sort of watercolor effect of yellow, but there, there is no yellow there. We've created that. So again, you've kind of got this very, um, again, this very strong relationship between light and neuronal firing pattern, but then at the lower level of the retina, but then, um, the brain acts with various other areas in a kind of more top-down top manner that 
compares what we're seeing to everything else we've encountered in the world. And this is also why we probably perceive um, some of these shapes as concave and some as, as some as convex because we're used to walking around with the sun up here, right? That's That's been our entire experience of the world. And so we assume that's what we're seeing. Whereas if we were just gonna look the images for what they were, they were just rotated. Um, but we 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 make all these assumptions based on all our previous encounters in the world. So I've used vision, but I really want you to um, realize that this kind of is happening for all senses is that um, there's this receptive field, the sort of sensory space that can elicit a response. It then gets topographically mapped. So the brain is using space to represent this information. But then there's this kind of further processing where lots of gaps and ambiguities can be filled in. Oh, and this is just a pause to remind me to, again, show you that, you know, light is coming from the sun and is just being reflected off different surfaces and um, that, that's really what's happening. I mean, that still just, just completely blows my mind that there's there's the sun that's like so far away and these photons are hitting our retina. And I kind of want you to realize that that's what you're doing. As architects, you are choosing how something from the sun ultimately like ends up like in our retina. But then coming from our experience, we kind of like this co-creative effort, um, we make all the assumptions, but I don't know. I just, again, it's this kind of traversing scale that I find so still mind-blowing. And this is another just prompt to remind me to say that, yes, okay, light illuminates our world and it's how we see things, but it's also entrains us physiologically, especially to do with um, metabolism and sleep. So um, a lot of research has been done around that and the kind of health problems that come along with shift work. And, you know, that's, that's another entry point. So light's not just about vision. We are organisms and um, we've evolved to be in relationship with the sun. So plasticity. So one of my favorite philosophers is William James. And I think he's, he writes really well on many topics of neuroscience that have been later proven to be true. And he says, the plasticity of the living matter of our nervous system, in short, is the reason why we do a thing with difficulty the first time, but soon do it more and more easily. And finally, with sufficient practice, do it semi-mechanically or with hardly any consciousness at all. This is also because the brain doesn't want to spend energy that it doesn't need to. It's already using a lot of energy to maintain these differences, right? So at the beginning, when you're learning something, you're probably like using a ton of neurons and then the brain wants to become more and more efficient. So I, again, I feel like nature is a good place to look for principles of you know being energy efficient our nervous systems have grown to the way in which they have been exercised just as a sheet of paper or coat once creased or folded tends to fall forever afterwards into the same identical folds and here's uh, alba's teaching his paper making paper folding class so a few a few decades later donald hebb um, theorized, again, this was a model, that when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, you know what firing means now, some growth process or metabolic changes takes place in one or both cells, such as A's efficiency as one of cells B firing is increased. And so this is what I was studying in my PhD can also become decreased depending on the pattern of activity. And you've probably heard this um, succinctly put as cells that fire together, 
together, wire together. And to refer back to the example I gave you about the ocular dominance columns, you remember the inputs from the left and right eye for these, form these stereotypical columns. Um, during development, if you cover one eye, um, this was done originally in cats by Hugo and Wiesel, you realize that the inputs from the active eye tend to take over, they become bigger. And the, the inputs from the eye without light uh, are diminished, the neurons. And so all this is to say that we do have the programming to develop and form these connections, but everything is always fine-tuned by what's coming in from the environment. And so this isn't just happening visually, it's probably happening in many different ways. But again, I'm showing you this striking example. And another example um, is, and research being done now, is how sort of in, a, in a, what we call an enriched environment, which for the poor rat is still only this, <laughs> but compared to a cage with nothing, um, their neurons have more processes and have more what we call spine. So there are these physical changes in the brain that um, occur if we're sort of more engaged with our environment. So you can see that again here, and there are these physical protrusions called spines that are important. Um, so I want to move on to a taxonomy of memory. Now we have a film coming up, I'm just gonna let you watch it and then explain. Oh, Hannah, I can't have the sound now. Is it letting you play the video at all? Oh, here we go. Oh, Thanks. there it goes. Thank you. During the operation, Perfect. Dr. Kobel made two small holes in HM's skull. Through these holes, he inserted retractors, which he used to lift up the front part of the brain, the frontal lobes. Aspiration requires inserting a small instrument into the intended target and sucking out brain tissue. So Scoville proceeded to remove the hippocampus on both sides, along with cortex surrounding it, areas that we know today are critical for the establishment of long-term memory. What are you describing? Reading your life. So you weren't remembering anything just now? No, it was like a dream. Like a dream or was it a dream? Well, it was like the reality. Still a dream. HM made a good recovery from the operation but it was immediately apparent that he could not lay down new long-term declarative memories. His immediate memory was fine, but the instant something distracted him, he lost all sense of what had happened just moments before. We now know that immediate memory lasts about 20 seconds. HM could therefore remember information for about 20 seconds before it was gone forever. HM remembers all that happened to him up to the time of his operation, but can recall next to nothing that has happened since. Between 1953 and 20 seconds ago, his episodic memory is blank, and that blank space grows longer at the same pace that his life moves forward. Okay, so HM, is a very famous case in history of neuroscience. He had epilepsy and his, um, he had his operation to remove his temp part of his temporal lobe. And although that cured his epilepsy, he then lost his memory, basically his short-term memory. And what was interesting about that, so this is a, beautiful drawing of the hippocampus by Cajal. You've probably heard of Cajal. Um, what was interesting about HM is that 
he could still learn certain things, especially motor tasks. He could learn this task called mirror writing, which was writing use of a mirror so it ends up being straight. Um, and that really led us to sort of formulate these more discreet ideas about memory, types of memory. And so he, he had no explicit memory, declarative memory. He couldn't tell you what he had for lunch yesterday, but he could learn things. And so I suppose I want to explain this because when you're going into a space, people could self-report about what happened in the space or how they feel in the space, but there's so much going on that we actually can't talk about, can't describe. And one of the most potent associations we have with memory is place. We have a task called a condition place preference. So um, sounds obvious, but you just put um, a mouse and you give it two options where to go. And there's usually something very nice or something very not nice. And even when you remove that stimuli, the area, the time they spend in the more rewarding zone, for instance, is increased, even if it's not there anymore, because they have these associations. So memory and place are very strongly linked, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So a, a, a task we have as well, because you can't speak to organisms and say, tell me what you remember, is spatial memory. And so this is called a Morris water maze. And you it's a basically a big swimming pool and the water is cloud, clouded with some sort of powder. And there's a hidden platform and the mice doesn't really enjoy having to swim around. So it wants to get to the platform. And of course, the first time it's in there it has no idea where the platform is. But after many, many trials, it can get there. And then we can test oh, how is this being done? Are they using spatial cues? If we use a drug to block this receptor, does that block the memory? Um, do they remember it after a certain amount of time? If we give a mouse model of um, Alzheimer's and give them this drug, do they get to the platform quicker? So you can see um, once they've had a few tries, they, they get there very quickly. They know it's around here somewhere and then they get there. So again, it's, it's, very, it's very linked between space and memory that we as neuroscientists use. This is another film I want you to watch. So every time you see a little white dot, that is a neuron firing an action potential. And this is a rat just moving around an arena. So you can see the neurons kind of fire this grid pattern, and this is actually called a grid cell. And um, it's, it's kind of a map that's formed in relation to the borders. And it's not the only spatial cell we have. We have face cells, border cells, head direction cells. But this, I think, is the most striking example, again, of how um, some neurons in the brain, very close to the hippocampus, um, respond to where the organism is in space. And I kind of really like this study that shows that in two adjacent areas that have a partition, they have their own separate grid cell representation. But when you remove the partition, it becomes this space. And I think of Stephen's hinge doors and storefront because I really feel like that's what's going on. Like, and what's really fascinating really about the hippocampus is that more and more research is being done showing that not only space is represented like that, but how we conceive of social hierarchy, concepts in general, and 
um, I really feel that this kind of removal of a division also kind of works on a conceptual level. When you're bringing, when you kind of have that kind of like moment of like bringing two things together that you haven't before. And so if, I, if ideas are being represented like this, then I can imagine some kind of, I don't know, synergy happened, but that's just pure speculation on my part. Um, so like I was saying, it's not just, you know, where you are in space. There's, there's space generated by um, many different concepts and we navigate space by integrating egocentric and allocentric res responses. So egocentric is the view you have of the world and allocentric is kind of more of like a bird's eye view. You kind of look down and see where you are in, in the world. And so this kind of is, if you think about it, how we form memories. Like when you talk about autobiographical memory, that's your egocentric view. And allocentric is your semantic memory, which is basically stuff you know about the world. And it's all to say that I really believe that time, space, and memory are the coordinates of our being. Um, and that's been known for a long time with, you know, exercises like the memory palace and things like that. So the final section is embodiment and the extended mind. So again, William James, um, we've, we've learned about plasticity. So moving on from that, he, he goes on to say that we're a bunch of habits and that he thinks we're a bunch of habits because we have um, bodies. And this is another kind of not so kind experiment, but kittens, you now know that the light is very important for the correct sort of wiring up of the visual system. And they were kept in the dark at night. In the day, they were brought into this arena and they, there was one kitten that could touch the ground and walk around and another kitten that was just in a basket and couldn't make contact with the ground. And even though both kittens had light input, so they had the light, which is thought needed everything correctly, the kitten that was remained in the basket remained blind the entire life. So it's not just about one sense acting on its own. It's about this integration of, of everything and how we move in the world that um, basically gets us to predict and interpret the world. And this is a section from my Self of Sense essay. So sensing, learning and memory are inherent to life. Um, every aspect of ourselves exists by detecting and comparing self to non-self, predicted to observed and interior to exterior. And maps of our body and of the world are how we navigate and they're formed dynamically. And through this simultaneous body world mapping, we exist. And most importantly, self and sense are not limited to the neurons and extend well beyond the brain. And so um, this is a comment by Bentley who wrote with Dewey um, on a text that was written by um, Sumner. So he goes to say, goes on to say, as we pass from bird nest to monarch shell, we find ourselves having moved from what we can probably agree is environment to what we can probably agree is organism without being able to say exactly where we cross the line. Again, the seeming security of the morphological conception is dissolving in front of our eyes. At least we can sympathize with Summer's conclusion that the organism and the environment interpenetrate each other through and through. Um, and uh, this is a quote that I like to begin to end on by John Dewey. So life itself consists of phases in which the organism falls out of step with the march of surrounding things and then recovers unison with it, either through effort 
or by some happy chance. And in growing life, the recovery is never a mere return to a prior state, for it is enriched by the state of dispar disparity and resistance through which it has successfully passed. If the gap between organism and environment is too wide, the creature dies. If its activity is not enhanced by the temporary alienation, it merely subsists. And life grows when a temporary falling out is a transition to a more extensive balance of the energies of the organism with those of the condition under which it lives. And so I ask you when you're designing, do you want your organisms to merely subsist or do you want them to grow? And James was keenly aware of the plastic nature of our nervous system. And so we can use that um, for beneficial um, output. And this is just a summary of some of my writings to write to me if you want any of them, because there's so much that I'd love to talk about that I haven't been able to talk about. And that's it. So I can stop. Leah, thank you so much. Um, I'm still processing. You went from um, speaking about um, light and how we perceive our, our environment to very all encompassing um, reality um, where organism and environment interpenetrate, as you said. This is, this is fascinating. Um, and you also put out the challenge how through design um, life can grow, um, and not just be, but uh, create those inputs and memories and, and stimuli that um, can enhance our being. Uh, it's it's fascinating and um, very all encompassing. I I would love to um, open it up for questions right away. There is so much we can unpack here. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, as Irene, I know it's a lot of information and I feel that students that I've worked with, sometimes it even will take them a year to really, you know, like appreciate. But I wanted to cover a broad spectrum and then in the crit or in studio, we can go deep. And that's what I really enjoy doing. I, I don't want to just dump information on people, but if there's an in because I'm an experimentalist, I'm a scientist, I like the doing part. And I know the, maybe that's why I like the pragmatist, I know the kind of insight that can happen through experimenting, right? Mm -hmm. So I really want this just to be an ongoing conversation with designers, but go, go ahead. <laughs> I was I was uh, taken by that experiment that uh, I had not uh, seen before where uh, the one kid has no connection with the ground and and how that um, completely uh, affects the the vision right directly in fact um, and so that that truly illustrates how interconnected that uh, sen sensorial uh, system is um, that that was fascinating yeah unfortunately it takes such cool experiments to make the point <laughs> these were done a long time ago <laughs> i'm also interested in and we um we had spoken about um during our uh, review of work uh, about color and temperature and uh how we perceive um uh, both uh, together in a way or one triggers the other even through memory or recalling a memory of a color for example we certainly have uh, colorful dreams right so we we color exists even with our eyes closed or as being completely unconscious or subconscious um so uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about those aspects yeah i mean you probably notice both literally and form and content i stayed away from color just because it's such a vast topic and it is so personal in a way. And I think when, 
when I'm saying you bring your previous experience in the world to something, there's a lot to do with color there. But definitely in the natural world, color is communicate used to communicate changes in temperature. And I think what's really fascinating is the use of color by cephalopods to communicate that we're only really beginning to appreciate. And I don't know if you've seen videos of octopi dreaming or well, what we anthropomorphizing, but you know, even when they're supposedly in a sleep state. Um, but I think through culture and through experience, we do tend to associate say red and orange and yellow with warmth and blue with coolness. Um, but I, I find color, what I would say about color, it's so context dependent and that's very important too. And you can set up, um, you can set up parameters that can help if you want a certain effect that can push things in that direction. But I really feel it's so personal that it's difficult to make hard and fast rules about color. We have a question from someone in attendance, Leia, uh, from Reggie, uh, who I think was one of our past residents. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, my question is about navigation and memory. In your experience, does a predictable environment, like an orthogonal city grid like Manhattan, make navigating space more comfortable or useful? Is it just useful for the first visit? To, or is it continually useful to one who is familiar? How would this differ in a natural landscape without a predictably anticipated set of landmarks? Does this change with scale, room, building, neighborhood, and city? Well, I think, again, um, it's going to be what you're, it, going back to the cat experiment, it's going to be what you're trained on, right? So if you grew up in the middle of the desert or the forest, I'm sure that you have um, developed so many kind of senses about how to know where you are, you know, for the sun, like the sun, for example, and to navigate using that. I think in an urban environment, um, then conceptually, we can all get what a grid is and so they can calculate distance based on that. And then over time, I think it's about what kind of experiences do you want to have? For instance, I find it interesting that I live about 20 blocks away from where I work. And if I'm walking to work, I walk the same 20 blocks. Why have I chosen that? Why have I chosen those blocks? I, there are so many other permutations. And I think in a more naturalistic environment, um, what you can create, unless you're just trying to get from point A to point B, is just alternative routes, which will probably lead to alternative thoughts and memories and experiences. And um, I think you decide what your priorities are. If your priorities are making sure someone gets from A to B, then there needs to be a sort of set of rules. And that's a very top-down thing. You need to understand what a grid is for it to, you're not, you're not inherently gonna be in a grid and go, oh, I'm, I'm gonna find my way around. That's what you do. You do that with losing landmarks inherently. You kind of remember where those are, you make the calculations and then you decide the shortest route. So I think there's a lot in there. I would say that it all depends on experience. Yes, the grid will be easier to navigate, but if you have the top-down understanding of what a grid is, um, but then what kind of experience do you want the user to have? How is that space going to be used? I think it's all dependent on those things. Do you think we kind of make these decisions too, Leah, when we think about how we want to live in terms of um, space making for our own private spaces? And I think of like the differences between like minimalism and maximalism like somebody who wants to live like a minimalist maybe wants to have 
fewer stimuli to come home to versus a maximalist who might be into collecting or these items that have certain meaning or memory for them. And that becomes more of a stimuli, stimulating environment and a, a different way to live. Is that personal preference too? And kind of what do you think about that? I think, I think it's all about the association you have. So if you want your space, the running space to be a blank sheet because you're getting your sensory input from some sort of self-generated imagination, or maybe you you don't have a very good filter and you you are very sensitive to everything around you. But then there are some people who do have a very good filter and are not so bothered. I would say they still are, maybe not consciously bothered by the environment. But then I think I feel people who have, like to have a lot of stuff, it's probably an unconscious or conscious need for security in some way um, because maybe they feel comforted by those things. And maybe they're also very grounding because of those associations. It kind of is a reflection of who you are. Oh, these are photographs of people who I love. These are the books that I love. Um, this is a cushion I bought on holiday, whatever it is. And it kind of kind of reminds you who you are, but it's all about the association we have with objects. And I think what's very interesting psychologically about that is the emotion attached to it. Like we all know how attached we were to our first toy. And if someone was to beat that toy up, we'd feel personally wounded. And so I think it's a kind of a spect spectrum of um, attachment and also, you know, about the differences we have. We're all, um, we don't have the same brain. So what some person might find stimulating, some person might find overstimulating. And I think if you're making a space for many users, you have to give options for all the different kinds of brains you're going to be catering to um yeah that was going to be my next question was how do we kind of mediate that in a space that would like probably entail many many different people using it with many different experiences um and backgrounds but yeah that makes sense well I think I think um just options are good so kind of there'd be like open spaces more um closed comforting like booth like spaces where people can have privacy or um you know I think like airports maybe are an interesting zone for that and it I feel like more and more there are these kind of kind of maybe for meetings I guess the, but there are kind of like these booths um but yeah I think just a, a gradient of stimuli would be good options. I have a question. Hi. Hi, Leah. Thank you so much for the lecture. I really enjoyed the moment when you pulled out the dichroic, the glass cube, and you held it to the camera, and the colors are changing. Um, I love working um, with natural sunlight. Like, I, I really love refraction, reflection, all this natural phenomena. But I also researched a lot in the past year um, for my thesis about artificial light, uh, especially um, in this era of LED light that we entered. Um, since like previous technologies of artificial light have been slowly uh, been obsolete. Um, and just my question would be like, so, you know, as I learned from my um, little bit of research that, you know, exposure to LED light, um, it's a very small spectrum of uh, of light that uh, LED light carries is mostly on the bluish end of the spectrum. And there, you know, our continued ex uh, exposure to it means that, you know, over the course of the time that we are, our bodies are kind of starved from like the full spectrum of the sunlight. And, mm -hmm. and for design, especially now, like uh, such, we have such a rich uh, variety of designer lamps or uh, artificial light products that are innovative, things like the sunset lamp and all this mood light, uh, mood light that people love having in their apartment. And my question would be like, 
in uh, kind of you know talking about new neuroplasticity, uh, exposure to LED light, you know how it affects our circadian rhythm, all this stuff. What is the responsibility for designers designing with artificial light? Like, can there is it like against um, you know how our bodies operate with with sunlight? Um, do you see sunlight and artificial light exposure both have some sort of meaning and function in our our biological you know function? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say what should and shouldn't be done, really. I'm I'm kind of against shoulds at this point. I can definitely I'm more a bit bit like let me help you get access to the information you want. Um, if you think just about the again on this kind of evolutionary time scale, how we've changed as a species since the invention of the light bulb, whatever. So I see it more as like these interventions, and maybe the screens um, will cause another intervention, just as the consumption of coffee has you know um i think what you have a responsibility for is is like it's like what you've done you've done as much research as you can and i think that if they're shown to be detrimental effects that we know about um then that needs to be made explicit and then there needs to be you know changes um i think it's difficult living in this society that the pressures we're all under um and if we know something can change our physiology to make us more productive it's probably going to be pushed in that direction um but then it will have an impact on our health. I mean, only now are we realizing um, the effect of shift work and stuff, metabolism. So I feel do do the research, and it seems to be a good rule for everything is to stick as close to nature as possible. You know, in terms of what you eat, everything. So, um, but then again maybe the design of the space is got to keep these people awake when they don't want to be awake you know in a hospital or something but I think maybe an interesting point is to consider darkness as important as light and where is the organism getting its period of darkness. But I, I mean, you have, a, you have a responsibility for sure, but I, I'm not comfortable yet telling, what people, telling people what they should do. <laughs> I, I want to, um, I want you to design the way you want knowing what you know. Thank you, Leah. Um, hi, Leah. I had a question um, about sort of, thank you so much for your talk. It was like really a beautiful and very spatial um, experience. Um, and I was interested in sort of your the mapping of um, like the planimetric and aerial mapping of um, spatial of spatial memory and movement. Um, both the I don't know I have a diagram of it, but I don't the like gridded the gridded rat one. What is that called? The grid, the grid yeah. cell, the yeah. grid cell, and um, like both the like moving through the water. Um, and I was wondering, um, sort of more on an experiential level, when you're at um, like within an interior space, like how sort of your um like the like a more perspectival view, um thinking about how um light and time um can sort of how like how you have sort of a map of like that space um through like the changes of light um within an interior space, both at the scale of 
of a day and or at the time of a day and at the time of seasons and mm. maybe like how long like as you continue living in that space like how you respond or like if you keep time in your body through that yeah absolutely I think unconsciously unconsciously I think um your body senses what time of day it is based on the position of the sun and you can also look and realize oh and I think that time is very interesting as a sense because we haven't found like the time receptor right everything else listen there is a light receptor there is an olfactory receptor there is a touch receptor but there isn't a time receptor so it's very experiential and I think that um there is a lot of writing about perception of time within the hippocampus that I happily share but I still think that people are debating that hi there I have one question about the color perception mm -hmm. um, um, you have explained all the our internal system very well like though we have uh, the same system but uh, do we perceive uh, the colors in the same way like uh, if a particular shade of red means the same thing for African person or a person from any other um, uh, field of uh, from the world or um, in the context or the culture or memories we yeah. have that's what that's why I kind of stayed away from color because yes the, we do have retinal ganglion cells that respond to color in this on off way um but remember when I said oh the brain fills in there's so much more of that going in on with the color so it's always it's always context dependent yeah thank you Irene, I'm just going to plug in my computer. Okay, sure, yes. And perhaps if there are any other questions from our residents or our attendees, maybe we can formulate that now or um, summarize with some closing remarks. La, um, um, I think you, you made it very clear the sense and perception of color is always context dependent and, and yet light and color um, truly influence our sense of, of time, our sense of depth, our sense of space in, in many um, intricate ways. Um, so a very complex undertaking. Um, there are there are certain things that may be universal though in the process or or are they not do you think there any any sense of um universality um well there are the we do tend to have rods and cones um so we do have the same receptors for color but there are a lot of the population is color blind right and we've got to remember that and um, the, 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 the principles are the same in that a certain, a certain, only a certain wavelength of light will stimulate that receptor. Only a certain color will stimulate the receptor, but how then that is processed is, is purely context dependent. So, at that kind of retinal level, yes, so we have things in common, but I, I can't say about 
I mean, we, we, and we can find a lot out by through illusions, right? Like the, the watercolor I showed you, you saw yellow, then there's no yellow. So that I think so, so many illusions are based on the way we perceive color. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big subject. And I actually think a lot of non-scientists have written well on it, like Alpers. <laughs> so. Yes, thank you so much, Leah. Um, and thank you to the residents for your great questions and attendees. Um, this was such a wonderful time together. And Leah, we really appreciate your continued involvement with the residency um, and with this lecture in particular today. Um, it was just amazing. And for anyone that would like to see the recording or share it, it's available on our YouTube channel. Um, tomorrow, our next lecture will be with Anne Hamilton our current T-Space um, artist. And with that, I would just like to say once more, thank you all. And we've really loved having you today.